So John chapter 3, verse 16, John chapter 3, verse 16, uh, a scripture that we all know, a scripture that many of us are familiar with, um, but I want to just, um, again, just share, share, share it from a, a different angle, uh, and, and I pray that God helps you, God ministers to you. We are in our series called Love Life. Uh, this is part three, and I'll be speaking today about love hurts, and I'm going to explain to you what that means in a, in a couple of uh, minutes. But, you know, we, in the part one, we spoke about how, lo how God's love is tough. His love is unconditional. Nothing can separate us from God's lover. Last week, we spoke about how in order for us to love others as we love ourselves, right? We have to get to the place where we are comfortable in loving ourselves. And both, uh, both uh, sermons are online. You can go back and revisit it. But today, I want to speak about love hurts. And I want to look at it from two angles. One, the fact that uh, uh, love has a price, right? And that price oftentimes is more painful than many of us may think or many of us may acknowledge. Uh, but also number two uh, is the, uh, also when I speak about the fact that we can end up hurting as a result of love. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, explain what I mean by that. But my prayer in all of this is that God will help you, God will minister to you and God will touch you. And so let's read our scripture together. John chapter three, verse 16, um, will, uh, one of the most famous scriptures, amen. Um, which it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have a everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. Help me pray. Father, anoint this message. Let our hearts be open to everything that you will say to us, O Lord. We give you praise and we glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said uh, Amen, amen. Now, a few years ago, and I'm not sure, um, you know, many, some of you will remember, but when, know that when I was a teenager, Jennifer Lopez, the R&B star, had a song out, uh, and the song was entitled, my, uh, Love Don't Cost a Thing, My Love Don't Cost a Thing. And uh, really, it was a song about, uh, you know, I don't know if some of you remember the music video uh, um, uh, and, and, and stuff, but it was really about uh, this guy who was trying to impress her with, um, with his money and his flashy cars and, and you know, his, his, uh, his wealth, really. And the point or the theme of, this, of the song was simply this, that, hey, my love doesn't cost a thing. My love doesn't cost um, all of these material things, right? And so I have an extract from the, from the lyrics. And uh, one of the lyrics says, one of the verses says, uh, you think the money you make can substitute the time you take. Take the keys to, here to my heart. Then you can win my heart and get what's in my heart. I think you need to take some time to show me that your love is true. There is more than dollar signs in you. Then you can win my heart and get what's in my heart. That is one of the verses in this song. And in essence, what she was saying is that, hey, the, 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 my love doesn't cost a thing. It doesn't cost dollars it doesn't cost money wealth cars right you don't need to impress me with all of these things but then when you look at the lyrics what she's in fact saying is hey even though it may not cost you in dollar signs it may not cost you in money it will cost you in time it will cost you in attention because i want you i want all of you i want who you are and I thought about this because this song and many songs like it oftentimes really reveal something when it comes to human interaction with love. And that is oftentimes we end up uh, misvaluing, we end up putting the wrong price on love. That here you have someone that thinks that love is to, to splash out money, then somebody else uh, interprets love as no, 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 I want your time. And there's this confusion and then this trouble that comes as a result of not really putting the right price tag on love. That some people uh, end up uh, um, in this place of love hurt uh, as a result of as a result of, of, of undervaluing love and giving away their love for too cheap, others may think they're being ripped off because the demand of love is just too much for them to pay. And there's always this conflict in human interaction with love uh, because some uh, we, because we don't truly understand what it is and we put the wrong price tag on it. And as a result of putting this wrong price tag on love, many people uh, 
end up getting hurt. Hence, I'm gonna, I've been titled this sermon, Love Hurts. And so many people end up in this place where they are hurt as a result of love because, hey, I, I, I expected something from this. And then I, I, what I expected to get out of this is not what I received. What I wanted to receive from it is not what I got. And as a result of this, people can end up in this place where uh, they are hurting as a result of giving love and as a result of, of receiving love. And oftentimes the problem is that we don't truly understand or we don't truly, amen, uh, uh, we, we haven't really defined love uh, properly in our generation or in, uh, in general. You know, and like I said, this sermon title, Love Hurts, has two meaning. One, it is uh, the fact that love has a price and the price that you're going to pay to be in a loving relationship, whether it is with your family, whether it is in marriage, whether it is with your children. Uh, love has a price tag that is very expensive uh, and it's going to cost you, it's going to be painful, amen, to pay this, but believe you me, it is worth it. Uh, but also so the second meaning to love hurt is the fact that we can arrive at this place in life where we are heartbroken, where we are disillusioned, where we, uh, in German, like you said, you have Liebeskummer, uh, where your heart is aching as a result of love. Uh, and, I, and also with that, I want to encourage you to let you know that God is able to heal, God is able to touch, and God is able to mend your broken heart. Amen. But the problem oftentimes comes because we don't understand or we we haven't defined love properly. Now, in our generation, what we think of love is that, you know, love is something that now oftentimes is this mysterious thing, amen. But the truth is when you don't understand the value of something, right, when you understand what something truly is, you fail to put the right value uh, on it. For example, this time uh, last year, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, me and my wife were in, in America. We were very fortunate to be able to go traveling before Corona and lockdown and everything else. So we were in New York and uh, one of my favorite shops is TK Maxx. Um, the, and then in America, it's called TJ Maxx. And so I was in my favorite store and I saw this bag. And some of you who know me, you know, I like backpacks. I love uh, 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 backpacks. And so I've got two, uh, I've got, my wife will tell you I've got too many, but I just, it's just my thing, right? And I saw this travel backpack, you know, and and to my surprise, I knew what this uh, backpack is. I knew the make, the model, uh, and I knew that this is an expensive backpack, right? But somebody put the wrong price tag on it. And so this backpack that should have cost anywhere between $90 and $100 was, had a price tag of $15 on it, right? $15. Listen, I made sure I grabbed it and I went to the till. Uh, and even the person at the till was, was shocked. They were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they were like, no, no, this, this can't be that price. So she called the manager. The manager came and then they realized it was a problem. But the thing is they had to sell it to me for that price, right? Because that is what I picked it up on and stuff. But as soon as they sold it to me, they went back and they made sure they fixed it. Uh, the rest of it, they put all the right price. They changed the pricing all that. But here I got something valuable for dirt cheap because whoever was labeling these bags didn't understand what bag it was. And they didn't understand the design. They didn't understand the value of this bag. And because they didn't understand the value of this bag, they put the wrong price label on it. And that is oftentimes what happens in human interaction and love, in that we don't understand what love is. And because we don't understand what love is, we place the wrong values on it, right? This is a, here is a dictionary.com definition of love, right? This is what our generation defines love as, right? And it says this, a profound, tender, passionate affection for another person, or a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection. And the third meaning of love is a sexual passion or desire. So this is the definition of love in our generation. And really and truly, love has become an adjective. What they've just told us is just a way of describing an emotion, right? Love has become this descriptive word, this four-letter descriptive word to describe how I'm feeling, right? Feelings of warmth and, and a passionate desire. And it all sounds great, amen. But listen, love is more than just emotion. Love is more than just how I feel. 
Love is more than just uh, how I feel about myself. Amen. Uh, and the problem that we have, you know, if love was truly an emotion, the problem, it was only an emotion. The problem is then this, that we go through the motions when it comes to emotion. And what I mean by that is that when it comes to emotion, you don't always feel warm and fuzzy. You don't always feel a, a deep desire and a drive. You don't always feel that, 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 that whatever dictionary.com defines love as. You don't always feel that, right? Because uh, we are humans and our emotions vary and our emotions change. And so if love was simply based on emotion, then there, there will be many, many unhappy people in our generation. And as a result, there are many unhappy people in our generation because love has become to mean how I feel. And the reality is this, oftentimes what people describe as love is really, they are in love with being in love. They are in love with being in love. And what, what, what I mean by that is, you know, I had a friend of, of, of many years ago that I was working with, a work colleague of mine, and he was, uh, uh, notorious, you know, uh, uh, every, every 10 months he will have a new girlfriend. And it be, this became like clockwork that whenever he said he's speaking to somebody, uh, you know, he, he found somebody, he would always say, Chris, I have found the one, right? This one's my true love. Oh, I'm so in love with her. You know, it's going to work out. And what usually happens is he spends uh, the first couple of weeks just texting her, chasing her, wooing her, sending flowers to her workplace and, and all that stuff. She will, uh, she will text back and they'll go back and forth. They ha they'll have dinner together. And then and then eventually they would, they would uh, uh, you know, sleep together and then, and then decide to go on holiday together. They were in a couple. And then what would usually happen is after the holiday, he would come back and then break up with her. And then the whole thing would start again. And this was in the seven years I worked with him, right? This was like clockwork. Every 10 months, this would happen. He would get to know somebody. Oh, Chris, I'm so in love. This is the one. No, no, this time it's really the one. I know I said that about the last. No, no, but this one is really the one. And then they'll go through the cycle again. And I remember sitting him down and I say, I said to him, bro, listen, you know, this is that's not love. You are in love with being in love. And what I, and, and I said, you are in love with this honeymoon period, this beginning of texting and getting to know. You are like a, 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 a you are like a, a, a cheetah chasing a gazelle, right? And you love the chase, you love the hunt. But once you 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 are with her, you don't know what to do. And I told him, I said, bro, that is not love. And many people find themselves in this place where as long as I, my love is driven by emotion, then it must be true love. And it's because our definition of love in this generation has become an adjective, a, a descriptive word. Love means to describe how I feel. But what we have to understand is that love is not just emotion, but love is really and truly the essence of love is action. Love is not a descriptive word. Love is a verb. It is a, 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 a doing word. Amen. It is an act, action word. And oftentimes uh, we have to understand uh, if we're going to move on and, 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 and if we're going to have healthy relationships when it comes to love, we have to understand what the biblical definition of love is, right? Because as believers, we go by the word of God, right? And so we need God's perspective on what love truly is. I know there are many singers and uh, of love songs out there, but please don't base what you consider love based on what the songs they sing about and what they do. No, no, no. Listen, base your, 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 your definition of love on what God says about love and on God's word. And so this is the biblical definition of love, right? And it says this in, in um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. And it gives us an idea of what love is, right? And it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to verse 7, it says, love suffers long, or love is patient, right? And love is, and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
And that is God's definition of love, right? God's definition of love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's not a, a, a deep, passionate desire about somebody. But God's definition of love really has to do with action. Listen, about, listen to all the different action words in that text, right? It says love, it says suffers, parade, behave, thinks, believes, hopes, endures. That, these are all doing words and God defines love as an action and this is the reality. We have to understand that, that love, for us to truly understand what love is, we must look at what love does, right? Because love is not a descriptive thing. Love is an active thing. It is an action. And therefore, we know about love. We understand God's love towards us, not because he just says it, but because he demonstrated it. In other words, we know what love is by what love does. And, how, and not just by how it feels. We know what true love is by what true love does, not by what it does, not, not by what it feels like. Not just by what it feels like. No, no, it's not just that, but what it does. But also in this scripture of 1 Corinthians 13 that I mentioned, we also see the ugly side of love, if I can call it that, or the painful side of love, the hurting side of love. Because again, it mentions in that same text, it says love suffers long, right? And suffering is not necessarily something we associate with love in our generation, in our context, right? To say that I love somebody, but I am going to suffer, it's not something that we put together, right? But God shows us that there's this part of love that is able to endure suffering, that is able to, 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 to go be in it for the long run. And it's not always this warm, fuzzy feeling, right? How many know when you're suffering, it is a painful experience? But God also puts it there and he says, hey, love is able to be patient. Love is able to, 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 to just bear it. Amen. It's going to be a painful experience, but love is able to do that. It says that love bears all things, that love can hold it all together. Amen. And then, and then it says love endures all things. That enduring is also something that we don't really put together with love in our generation, Right. But God tells us that, hey, if you're going to experience true love, right, which is kind, which is patient, which is all these things, you also have to understand that true love comes at a price. It's going to hurt, right? It's going to hurt. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to be long suffering. You're going to have to bear all things, right? And that is the reality of what I'm speaking to you about today. When I mentioned to you this sermon entitled Love Hurts, is because love isn't always pretty. Love isn't always smooth. Love isn't always comfortable. Love isn't always sweet. Sometimes love is un comfortable sometimes love hurts sometimes love uh, uh, causes pain and suffering but we have to understand uh, that in it all amen uh, there's a price attached to love uh, and when we don't describe uh, when we reduce love to just an emotion uh, when it, when the emotion runs out uh, people are no longer willing to pay that price oh i am i no longer feel in love so therefore i will no longer show love uh, and they because the foundation and the definition of love that they have is wrong to begin with. So the real question we have to ask ourselves is this. It's not about what God, what love feels like, but really it's about what does love do? That is really what we have to ask ourselves. And so maybe you're here and you are in a relationship, you are in a marriage, you are in a, in a friendship with somebody and sometimes you question the love of your parents towards you. You question the love of your spouse towards you. You got to ask yourself, okay, what does it, it's not, it's not necessarily what it feels like, but what, what is love doing, right? Because by what love does, you know it's love. Love is not defined by how you feel, but love is defined by what it does. And this is what we see in our text, John chapter 3, verse 16. And we want to look at this in a different light, amen. And I understand this is the most famous scripture uh, in the whole world. Everybody knows it off by heart, amen. But I believe there's some, some things that we can take from this that will really help us 
in, in learning about love and how to love and how to receive love uh, and how to overcome, you know, the pain that comes with, with being, having been hurt as a result of love. And so our text, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, the world, right? And it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't say God just loved the world and then he went and had a nap and just chilled out and went to sleep because he had, it was full of this fuzzy, fuzzy feeling. No, no, it says, God so loved the world that he gave, he acted, right? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And there's a couple of things that we have to learn about love because the truth is, like I mentioned, love is action and love does. And so love is action and love does. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, love will make you do crazy things, right? And there's an tr- element of truth to that because love will cause people, amen, to cross deserts, will cause people to swim across oceans and do something that they never thought was possible. Why? Because uh, love is action and love does. Amen. And we've got to be very careful not to throw around the word love so much in our generation. You know, one of the things that... Um, um, <laughs> I, I hesitated in doing when I started courting my wife um, is I, I hesitated for a while to tell her I love you, right? Uh, and it was because I wanted to be in a place where when I say I love you, I meant it. And I didn't just want to throw it around because before, I know, I had I'd dated before and I told people, hey, I love you, I love you, and nothing's come of it, right? And I said, listen, I want to make sure I'm in this place where when I say I love you, I mean it. I really mean it. And, you know, after three months, we got engaged, we got married uh, and stuff. And, and, and we've now been married almost 11 years. Uh, amen. But, but, I, but I realized for me, it was important that I didn't just throw that word out. Because ultimately, what happens is when something becomes uh, common, right, and becomes thrown around a lot, we lose the value of it. And I wanted her to know, hey, when I say I love you, listen, this is, this is not just another thing I'm, I'm, I've told somebody that I'm telling you, no, no, I really mean it. I really, really mean it uh, and stuff. And by God's grace, amen, she was patient with me and uh, we got married and the rest is history. But you know the story of, of Jacob and the Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel and he loved Rachel. Why? Because of you know, he fell in love with her. It was love at first sight uh, and so forth. Uh, but we know the story that he was willing to work seven years for her, right? He was willing to work seven years. In other words, again, his love was not just a, a, a thing of the moment. His love was an active thing, right? And his love, uh, we know he loved her because he was willing to work the seven years. And the Bible says that at the end of it, the seven years, it felt like a couple of weeks for the guy because he was so much in love with her. In Genesis 29 verse 20, it says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. And we also know what happened, that there was this wife swap, amen, from his uncle Laban. And this is something cultural that we don't understand completely, that how he could swap the wife. And in the next morning, he wakes up to a stranger. Anyway, but the Bible says that he was willing to work another seven years for her. So in total, he worked 14 years for this woman that he loved. Why? Because love is action. Love is action. Second thing we have to understand is that love is a choice. Because love is not dictated by my emotions, you can choose to love. You can choose, you can decide to love, right? You can decide to love. And oftentimes, this is where we, we, we get into trouble sometimes and we, 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 we uh, um, have a hard time sometimes because in our generation, in our way of thinking, for me to love somebody, I must like them. But in the Bible's description of love and in the Bible's definition of love, you can love somebody without liking them. That you can show love and you can be kind to somebody and it, does, it has nothing to do whether you get on with them and whether you like them. Why? Because you can choose to love. Love is a choice that you make. Again, our text says this, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? How many know nobody forced God the Father, amen, to give us his only begotten son? This was a choice that he made and he chose to give. He chose to release. He chose to give. He chose to act. 
And oftentimes, when we, we again, we're uh, speaking about love hurt, amen, is the fact that you know, sometimes the painful part of love is deciding to do something for somebody. It's deciding to act on behalf of somebody. And oftentimes we can, when you, when you, especially when you feel like the person has wronged you, the person has hurt you, the person has violated you and stuff, and you're thinking, oh, because of what they've said and done, I can no longer love them. Listen, you can still choose to act kindly. You can still choose to bear with them. You can still choose to act lovingly. You can still choose to behave wisely. You can still choose. Why? Because love is a decision. It's a choice. There's a, a, a family friend uh, of, of uh, um, family friend that you know her husband sadly uh, a few years ago passed away from uh, from cancer and they were married 36 years they had two um, you know lovely kids together and when the husband passed away the the wife described it as my soulmate has moved on. And, you know, and from outside looking in, you know, they had a wonderful marriage and, and everything else. But what I, I, I was shocked to find out was the fact that, you know, they didn't meet under traditional circumstances. And what I mean by that is it, it wasn't like they, uh, they, they, uh, came, they came to each other organically and they fell in love. But they, 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 they met together through arranged marriage. Uh, back in India, so their parents, you know, on, put them together, right, in this arranged marriage. And something she said that that stuck with me. She said we were we came together, right? Our parents brought us together, but we chose and we decided that we we're, we're, we're going to love each other. And as a result of making that choice and that decision to love, right? She says all the emotions, the feelings that come with love follows. Because love is not just an emotion. Love is a, a decision. Love is a choice. Love is action. And oftentimes we miss the trick because the emotions follow, right? The emotions follow where our heart and the mind is. Our emotions would follow these things. Amen? And so she said, hey, we decided to love each other. And they had the most wonderful marriage, most wonderful kids. Amen. And I say this for us to understand something, that the reason why many people suffer from love hurt is because, again, they don't understand. We've just reduced love to just these emotions, this fluffy stuff. But listen, the word of God tells us love is action. Love is a choice, amen. And love is a decision that we have to make. So the truth is love hurts. And the reason love hurts is because love in its purest form is selfless. And this is the part that makes love so hard to do. Love in its purest form is selfless. Our scripture again says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That loving us, the act of loving, it cost God something. It cost him, you know, he, it cost him, amen. He gave his son, he cost him something close to him. And how many know to give your, your only begotten son? This is the, the a selfless act. Right to be willing, amen, to go without, to be willing, amen, to, to, to not have so that the person you love can have. And oftentimes, uh, listen, the reality is the problem with, with, with again, our generations that we're so uh, driven to be selfish that the act of selflessness, when you're in a loving relationship, whether it is in your marriage, whether it is uh, with uh, a future spouse, whether it is with uh, 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 friends or family members is the act of being selfless and this is the part that really hurts because I have dreams I have hopes I have plans I have ambitions this is what I want to do this is my agenda this is my five-year plan but in order for you to experience love there's got to be a part of you that is willing to be selfless there's got to be a part of you that is willing, amen, to just lay it all down, to just to say, hey, listen, it's not about me. It's about the other person. 
That as a parent, if you're going to love your children, amen, you have to understand it's not always going to be a warm and fluffy thing. Sometimes it's going to be a painful thing where you will just have to sacrifice. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to close your eyes. You're going to have to suffer long. Why? Because that is what it takes for love, amen, to be expressed and for love to be communicated, amen. And the reason why love hurts so much and being selfless so much is because it it is easier to receive than it is to give. And oftentimes when we enter in loving relationships, well, let's be completely honest here, right? We only think about the receiving part of it. We enter relationships with, with our hands open, ready to receive, right? Because it's easier to receive than it is to give. So we are ready to receive. And oftentimes we receive something, but sometimes we, we, we don't receive what we think we should receive. And then oftentimes we don't even give, right, in order to receive. And people find themselves in this thing because, again, they have this, this wrong understanding of what love is. And love is action. And love is something, amen, that if you're going to experience, you have got to be willing to give. You've got to be willing to be selfless. And this is no doubt a painful thing, a painful thing to do. On the other side of this, you have people who went into love expecting to receive something. And unfortunately, what they expected to receive, they didn't. In fact, instead of receiving the, uh, a selfless act, instead of receiving uh, uh, sacrifice, instead of receiving uh, adoration, instead of re receiving all of these um, good nature things that comes with love, they ended up receiving uh, a broken heart. They ended up re receiving insults and, and whatnot. It just ended tragically. And there are many people in this category who are in this category of love hurt. They, they've experienced the pain that comes with loving somebody. And they have a broken heart as a result of this. But the truth and the reality of what we have to understand is this, that Jesus made this announcement when he entered into the temple in Luke chapter 4. And along with saying that the Spirit of God is upon him, right, to set the captives free, right, and all of that stuff, he says he's come to heal the brokenhearted. That if you're in this place right now where as a result of maybe you entered into this loving relationship and you didn't understand everything that came with it, you undervalued your love, you gave your love too cheaply away, uh, and, and you, know, you gave your heart to someone, some guy, some girl, they just didn't know what to do with it, they didn't value your heart, they ended up smashing it to the floor, breaking it in a million pieces, and you are left with your broken heart. I want to encourage you and let you know that Jesus right, is an expert in mending hearts. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. He's able to mend our broken hearts. He's able, amen, to put it all back together. He's able to, to restore a broken heart. What I love about Jesus is that he doesn't come on the scene and see your broken heart, amen, and decide, oh, what a waste, and move on. But he comes alongside of you and helps you pick up piece by piece, even the smallest piece that you thought there's no point in picking this part of Jesus will roll up his sleeves and pick up your broken heart piece by piece. Why? Because he wants to restore your broken heart. He wants to mend your broken heart. He wants you to get to a place, amen, where you can choose to love again, where you can choose, amen, to be vulnerable again, where you can choose to trust somebody with your heart again. And he's able to restore your heart. And he came on the scene and says, hey, I have come to heal the brokenhearted. There's something I want to share with you. And I recently came across this and I find this so cool. And I'm just going to um, uh, uh, share with you, amen. And I hope you can look and see my, my, my screen. Um, uh, but this is a picture, amen, of... Um, here we go. Let me just find it, amen. This is a, a, a picture of... Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just going to... Here we go. Here we go. And I hope you can all see it. But here, this is a picture of a, of a, of a broken vase, right? That has been restored. But 
it has been restored with gold. Think about it. It's a broken, it's a broken pottery, right? It's, it's, someone knocked it down. Somebody was careless, right? And it, it was broken, but they've restored it and they didn't just restore it with sellotape. They restored it with gold. And as a result of it being restored with gold, it's become something more valuable. And I, 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 was, I couldn't, I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is something broken. Why would you use gold to fix something broken, right? Why would you use gold? Gold is valuable. Gold is expensive. Why bother using gold to restore something that has been broken? In fact, you could sell that gold and, and buy a new one, right? These are all the things that were going through my head, right? But listen to me. They say that after they've, 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 they've been restored with gold, this thing becomes more valuable than it had ever been, right? And I thought about this with Jesus and what Jesus does with us and how Jesus mends our broken hearts, amen. Because Jesus uh, mends our broken heart and he doesn't just do a half a job, but when he restores your broken heart, amen, he restores you in such a way that in the end, you are better than you were at the beginning. In the end, after you've experienced his broken heart and you have allowed his blood, amen, to, to tie you together, to pull you together, you've allowed his love to mend you together and mend your broken heart. At the end of it, you are more better than you were at the beginning. And in order for somebody to use gold to restore something broken, it means that they understand the value of it. I want to tell you that Jesus understands the value of your heart. Jesus understands the value of your heart. He knows the value of your heart. He knows the value of your heart. And that's why he takes time to mend it together. So you can get to a place, amen, where you can love again. That people may have ripped you off, but you, you have to understand you are capable of love and you are capable of being loved, Right? And he's able to restore. And so even though you are in this moment right now where you're still hurting from what has happened, I want to encourage you to surrender your heart to Jesus. And say, Jesus, pick up these broken pieces. I don't know what to do with it. But give him your broken pieces. Give him the broken heart. And he will heal your broken heart. He will restore. He will mend. He will, amen, pull it all back together, amen. Because Jesus knows the value of your heart and is able to restore. In closing, I want to say this. Love is never easy, but it is worth it. It may hurt to love, right? It may be painful to be selfless. It may be painful to, 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 to be, make yourself vulnerable again. But listen, I want to encourage you, love anyway. Yes, you may love people and you may not get back the love. You may not receive anything in return, but love anyway. Because the reality and the truth is, right? Even though love in a, it can be a difficult thing, it is worth it in the end. There's no greater force in the whole world than love, right? This is why we have to understand that sometimes we... we, 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 we we get to places, amen, where we're thinking, Do, should I bother? Should I not bother? We give up on our friends. We give up on our family. We give up. I want to encourage you. Don't give up, amen. Keep loving. Keep loving because you don't understand what your love can do for them. You don't understand how your love can turn things around. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's, 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 it endures, amen. But we have to understand that when it comes to love, we have to take the good with the bad. Like in, in, a, in a text I mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about love being kind, love being patient love having all of these virtues but along with that in the same block of text it talks about love being able to endure love being able to suffer long and all of these things why because uh, love was never meant to be easy it was never meant to be it's, it's not a straightforward thing but what we have to understand as we move on is love hurts but it's worth it it's worth it I may be hurting right now, but in the long run, it's worth it. I may be suffering right now, but in the long run, love, there's so much to love. It's not just about one emotion. And because I don't feel that one emotion anymore, I'm going to pick up my bags and I'm done. No, no, I'm going to choose to love. I'm going to act lovingly. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's an action, right? It's a choice. It's a decision. It's an action. And I'm going to choose to be selfless. 
in my relationships with my family, in my relationships with my friends, in my relationship with my spouse, I'm going to choose to be selfless. And you'll be amazed the, the wonderful things that come as a result of love. In closing, many people speak about happy endings and happy, uh, uh, happy ever after, right? Listen, when you sit down with people that have been married uh, 50 years, they've been married 60 years, they have had wonderful, wonderful loving relationships, amen. And you sit down, you speak with them, you, you hear stories and after stories and you are like, wow, it's not all been a bed of roses. It's not all been easy, but the reason why it's, it's, it's lasted, right? It's because both understand it may not be easy, but it's worth it. There's a, a quote that says, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all." And the idea is that it's better for you to have loved and experienced love and even have lost it than to have never ever experienced love. And what they're saying is that even with all the difficulties that come with love, overall, it is a better experience than to never love at all, right? And I want to encourage you, let's live by God's definition of love. It's not just an emotion. It is a, a, a decision. It is an action, right? But it's a selfless thing. Let's not just live by the world's definition of emotion because we will never get anywhere. But, but let's live by God's emotion. I mean, let's live by God's definition. And I believe that God will bless each and every one of our relationships, our interactions with love, with one another. God's going to help us in all of that. Amen. Uh, let's bow our heads as I quickly um, pray. Um, Father, we thank you so much for this word today. We thank you for helping us, O oh Lord, to understand, O oh Lord God, uh, the true nature of love, O oh Lord. And I pray that you will um, move upon this word and Lord, it will sink into our hearts. It will become established. It will take root, O oh Lord God, in our minds, O oh Lord, uh, and it will be something that we'll live by. Father, we ask for your blessing and your grace over us, Lord, to be people who will uh, choose to love, who will decide to love, O oh Lord, who will act in love, and who will be selfless, O oh Lord, for your glory. And Lord, may you bless each and every one of our relationships, may it be with our family, with our children, with our friends, may it be in our marriages, O oh Lord God, may you bless it, O oh God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Also, as I always do, I want to give an opportunity. Maybe uh, you're here and, and, and you're not right with God. And this is just a, a real honest assessment of your own heart. And you will that, you know, look deep within your own heart and, and, and say, look, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I need, I need to make things right with God. Uh, and I want to just pray with you, right? I want to pray with you to make things right with God. Maybe, um, you know, uh, you are, you're backslidden, maybe you're in sin and you just be gonna, and you know, you just need God's forgiveness. Um, so maybe you are in a place where you're hopeless and you're thinking, surely God can't love me after this. I want to just pray with you. We want to pray a prayer of repentance. We want to pray a prayer of surrendering. And ultimately we want to give Jesus access to our hearts. And so just repeat after me um, as I lead you in prayer. And then just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice for my sins. Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and that I desperately need you and I cannot live without you. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and become king of my heart. I ask you to transform my life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. And last thing I want to do is I want to pray specifically with people here that you are, you have been on the receiving end of mistreatment. And when it came to love, you know, you gave your heart to somebody and they didn't know what to make of it. They, they didn't know how to treasure your heart because your heart is so valuable and so precious. They just didn't know how to handle it and they didn't understand the worth of your heart and they ended up breaking it. They ended up you know, and you're in a place right now where you even question whether you can be vulnerable again, whether you can, you can, you can, you know, surrender, whether you can be vulnerable again, whether you can love again, 
Maybe you question whether you, you are worth being loved. I want to pray with you right now. And we want to just pray together. If this is you, you can just repeat after me. Uh, if this is not you, you will just pray. Amen for uh, anybody else that, that may apply to. But let's just pray and just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have come to restore the brokenhearted. And I ask you to restore my broken heart. Lord, you know the pain, you know the, the suffering and everything associated, oh Lord, with my experience and what happened to me. And Lord, I pray that you will mend my broken heart and you would make it new, make it something great, oh Lord, that I can be able to love again and be loved and receive love. Lord, help me, oh God, to choose to be vulnerable to you, oh Lord. And to understand that I can trust you completely, Lord, with my heart. That I don't need to take matters into my own hands. I don't need to uh, watch over my own heart, but I can surrender my heart into your hands. And it's in perfect, it's in the, it's in the perfect place, oh Lord. And Lord, I pray that you will mend my broken heart today. And going forward, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, amen.